Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Cerebral Blood Flow Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, this is our seventh session uh, so far since July. So welcome back to uh, today's session, uh, which will be uh, hosted by uh, Sandra Billinger, uh, who shall be the keynote speaker and chair for the session. Um, my name's Caroline Ricards, for those of you who haven't been to one of these sessions before, um, and my co-host is Pat Brassard. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few uh, rules of engagement for you before we get going with the session today. Um, first of all, if you could please keep your microphone on mute and your video off throughout the session. Um, at the end of each talk, there will be time for questions. Um, and if you could please type those into the chat uh, or raise your hand um, and you can actually ask them verbally if you prefer to. So uh, we'll manage those questions as they come through after each presentation. Um, the session will be recorded and is being recorded right now and will be posted on the Carnet website um, within a couple of days immediately after each session. And the website address is here on this slide. Um, I'd just like to actually um, uh, tell you also about the Cerebral Water Regulation Research Network. Um, so this was a network established in 2010. It's a multidisciplinary community of researchers working in various aspects of cerebral blood flow regulation and um, including physiologists, uh, clinicians, and um, uh, uh, signal processors. Um, and so if you'd like to join the Cerebral Water Regulation Research Network, please uh, send me an email and your CV and I'll add you to the mailing list. Um, today actually marks the midway point of our seminar series for 2020. And I just wanted to introduce or show you here the, the statistics so far from the last six, six sessions that we've had. Um, so we've had six keynote speakers, 23 uh, trainee or early career researcher presentations. Uh, we've averaged about 226 registrants for each session, and of those, about 137 have attended. Uh, so it's about 60% of registrants have actually attended each session. Um, and we've also had about 102 uh, views on YouTube per session so far, uh, with a range from 82 to 162. So we've had some great visibility from all these sessions so far. So thank you all for continuing to support our, uh, the, the goal of the, this program. Um, and uh, please distribute this information far and wide so we can continue to have uh, great attendance at these sessions. Okay, so moving on to uh, a quick introduction for our keynote speaker today. Uh, so Dr. Sandra Billinger is a professor at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, and Dr. Billinger's main area of research interest is on cerebral blood flow control under various clinical conditions, uh, mainly in stroke and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Dr. Billing is actually a trained physical therapist and a PhD. Um, so we're very happy for, for her to be here today uh, to be our keynote speaker. And the title of her presentation is Cerebrovascular Dynamic Response During Exercise in Chronic Disease. So Sandy, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Caroline. So it's really an honor to, to be here this morning. Uh, and, and talk with you. And so I changed my title a little bit because I'm going to focus on uh, stroke and uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And I like to think of this as also healthy brain aging. And we, when we think about people who are at risk for um, possibly dementia or vascular dementia, Alzheimer's disease, uh, thinking about those individuals as well. So I always have to disclose that I do have a uh, pending patent. So I wanted to share a little bit of my background so that you can see this thread of who I am, which is both uh, an exercise physiologist um, was my background. And then I, I decided I wanted to work more with people with clinical disease, specifically neurological disease. And uh, I got my degree as a physical therapist. And then I became really interested in uh, people with stroke specifically, and I found some literature that really started looking at blood flow and how during exercise in the peripheral vasculature that um, blood flow was different. And so uh, I finished a postdoctoral fellowship, and then as a clinician scientist, I wanted to carry that through a little bit further and worked on flow mediated dilation techniques and got a NIH K01 award to, to do that. So one of my early studies, uh, as I was learning, uh, as, after I finished the flow mediated dilation training, I wanted to really do a, um, a very rigorously controlled study. It was a pilot study that really looked at um, you know, exercise parameters, very well controlled. I uh, wanted to really focus on maintaining and really making sure I was in these zones for people with strokes so we could 
really look at outcomes. And I wanted to combine both my cardiovascular training as an exercise physiologist doing exercise testing with a functional outcome, which the six minute walk test is a pretty well used uh, measure in, in people with stroke or other chronic conditions as a measure of um, functional capacity in the community. And then added my uh, flow meter dilation techniques. However, during that time, I had a lot of people really questioning, um, you know, you work with people with neurological disease. Uh, Dr. Rich Macko at the University of Maryland said, you know, Sandy, your blood flow work is really great, but what about cerebrovascular measures? I really think you should start thinking about taking what you know in the periphery and starting uh, applying it to brain health. So I pondered on that a little bit and thought, you know, what a great idea. I should really be looking at this. We, we see differences on the stroke-affected side. You know, I, I really wondered what we would see in people with stroke. Well, during this time, I had a really unique opportunity um, to really kind of expand what I knew about brain health and, and pairing up with our KU Alzheimer's Disease Center. Um, they, their focus is really on lifestyle interventions. Um, and so they were getting ready to start a trial, and I thought, wow, what a great way to leverage some of this vascular data in what they were doing in uh, Alzheimer's prevention. And so they were collecting data, <clears throat> they were bringing people in through uh, an R01, and these individuals were well characterized for cognition. Uh, they were also getting PET scans. Uh, they were doing neuroimaging to really make sure that these people didn't have any other underlying uh, cerebrovascular disease. And then those who were considered elevated beta amyloid actually went on to enroll in the exercise program or the intervention. And so I thought, you know, this would be a great opportunity for our lab to really explore vascular risk. And so I wrote a grant uh, just as they were getting ready to start, and it got funded. Uh, we looked at the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease score, so really just wanting to kind of put this vascular risk uh, into play and, and see what we would uh, get. And then also uh, flow-mediated dilation techniques. Um, but then today, I'm really going to focus on the cerebral vascular measures, since this is really the focus of the, the talk. So in these older adults, <clears throat> they were really considered from a standpoint of healthy brain aging for the ones who were non-elevated because they were at a low risk for, for uh, amyloid buildup. They had no evidence of cerebrovascular disease. And again, they w underwent rigorous um, cognitive testing by a neuropsychologist. And so, you know, in this group, we really wanted to look at the influence of, of uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, both at rest and then with exercise MCAV. And when I define MCAV, again, we're just looking at the middle cerebral artery uh, velocity. Um, and we were curious at whether or not this could be, this response or this change from rest to exercise uh, could be a potential biomarker for white matter lesion. Uh, again, you know, not everybody can get into the scanner. Not everybody likes to go into the scanner. Uh, so could we find some uh, biomarker? But what I'm really going to, again, just because of time, focus on today is this exploratory aim that we had. And that was looking at people uh, who were um, confirmed with elevated uh, beta amyloid. And this was done through the KU Alzheimer's Disease Center with three independent raters. Uh, and really looking at the idea of non-elevated. And the reason we wanted to do this is that um, there's a great animal study, uh, animal model that had suggested that um, the, the animals that, you know, they were wild type mice and they were they bred to express certain levels of the amyloid precursor um, protein. And so the study showed that the, the animals that had expressed higher levels of this um, APP plus protein had actually worse cerebral vascular function. So we thought, well, can we take you know, that data and can we look at that in this um, population and, and see what we find? So again, we looked at the MCAV response from rest to moderate intensity exercise. And I, you know, many of you on the the on this uh, um, seminar is probably familiar with this setup. Uh, we've changed it a little bit and got a bigger room because we've had more studies come through and um, kind of changed up. But we have actually now t tables. We've progressed to actually high-low tables so we can get their arms um, the exactly the way we want it. 
Uh, but here we have, uh, you know, transcranial Doppler, we monitor EKG, uh, we get B2B blood pressure, monitoring CO2. And then for those that, um, you know, may question, you know, are curious about the exercise device, we tend to use the recumbent stepper, and this is really um, geared towards our clinical populations. Uh, for people with stroke, cycles are hard. Uh, even the recumbent cycles can be challenging, and over time and in my career, I've really um, come to appreciate the recumbent stepper and that what we can use so that we can have people with stroke uh, and other people um, participate in, in um, our studies so we can look at this. <clears throat> So all of us, uh, except two people, were really blinded to amyloid status. So again, this was done at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. Um, the, the individual keeping track of that kept that on her, um, on her G drive. And so not only the sonographer, but anybody doing data collection was blinded to amyloid status. They would rest for 15 minutes. And again, we were doing this in, in sitting because of the exercise piece. Um, and then our, if you look at the, our data, we actually average across the whole eight minutes uh, that we're, we're doing this. Once they've finished their rest and we get everything set up, then we record for that eight minutes. We use 55 to 65 percent of heart rate reserve in this study. Uh, you'll see that we've changed this, and this was based on uh, newer ACSM guidelines for what's moderate intensity. But at the time of this study, we went with this definition for moderate intensity. After the rest period, once they got their, um, once we had them exercise and we got their heart rate to the target range, we went ahead and made sure that it was stabilized and that they could um, keep it at that range. So we let them go for about a minute or two just to make sure heart rate was, uh, was stabilized. And then we'd begin, begin the recording. And again, same as before, the data that you're going to see, it was averaged across all eight minutes. So what we found is that, uh, and, and you have, to, and you know, we expected um, about one in every person. I'm sorry, one in every three people to have elevated beta amyloid based on prior literature. And what we found was it was really one in uh, about every five or six had elevated beta amyloid. So you'll see that our, our numbers are are not quite equal uh, across our enrollment uh, with that. But you'll see that there's no significant difference when we look at these two groups between age, sex, education, and then cardiovascular risk, you know, starting to move towards that 0.05, but it was not significant. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you look at, at our data, again, remember all of these individuals were uh, characterized as uh, cognitively normal by their tests. However, if we look at how these individuals scored, the people with um, beta amyloid, um, you know, actually had a worse um, memory score and also processing speed. So what we found was that there was no group differences at rest and for any of our, our variables, <clears throat> but we did see a difference in, um, uh, in the exercise response. And I think this is something that's really important and things that I, you know, talk to my team and my students about is that, you know, as, as a physical therapist, if you're not walking, I can't see any deficits in your, your, your walking or your running. Um, you know, so we challenge the system. We see the, the most deficits when we challenge people's balance. Um, you know, not just standing still, but also in that dynamic mode. And so I, I really like the idea of challenging the system uh, in different ways to look at that cerebral vascular response. Uh, and again, we define this as for, for this published work. It's just the change in centimeters per second going from rest to moderate and uh, moderate ex exercise. And so again, it's just, it's, we're just simply subtracting it in this study. But during exercise, we didn't see any group differences for um, exercise map or uh, CO2. And so if you look at, at, at this, this graph here, this was again, the 70 people, um, and so you'll see, I just for, to help, you know, individuals on, on, on the uh, seminar here, you know, this was the dividing line is 1.1, which was, again, what was determined not by me, but by the ADC and others in the field that a global amyloid burden of 1.1 or greater is considered um, elevated. And so, uh, again, you can see as elevated load, uh, I'm sorry, as amyloid load starts to increase, we see a much lower response. And this is 
a little bit along the line of what the, the animal model showed. However, we see some variability in that. We see that, you know, one person that, you know, has a little bit more amyloid uh, has a higher response. And then, you know, I always love to look, I love graphs. And so I'm always looking at, um, you know, plotting things and just trying to get a sense for, for what data would look like. And we have some people that have, you know, higher values and some people over here that have really lower values. So I started thinking about, well, what if we flip this uh, upside down and really started thinking about it from uh, a vascular point of view? Um, and, and, you know, and really kind of thinking about what that would, would look like. And so I asked for the, the amyloid scans. And again, just so I could see what individuals, you know, in these groups might look like. And so this scan right here is this dot, um, specifically this person. And again, so you can see the red along here is the amyloid burden. So we can see that this person has quite a bit of amyloid. Uh, this scan corresponds to this dot. So again, we can see that there's some hot spots in here. Um, but again, for the most part, it looks very different from here. And then I was thinking, well, what if, um, you know, what if we looked at this and the person who had the lowest had more uh, amyloid load? And, you know, visually, as you know, you can't really tell that, that difference. And so uh, I started to think about how could we get at this question a little bit better. So I um, started to think about this again. I, I, you know, I keep thinking: Can we use CVR as a biomarker for brain health? You know, is there something about this any any challenge that we do, whether it's sit to stand, um, you know, five times up and down exercise? You know, is there some way that we can get at some biomarker uh, that's not, you know, something that requires the scanner? So again, people that go in the MRI, not everybody likes it, wants to go in it, or can. Maybe they have a pacemaker or some metal in their body that doesn't allow them to go in. Uh, when we do our amyloid scans, it's between four and 5,000, and I think that's a discount. Um, uh, it's really expensive. And so again, are, are there ways in which we could get it at risk factors for beta amyloid load looking at vascular health? <clears throat> so, you know, we think about APOE status. Uh, this is a risk factor for uh, accumulation of beta amyloid, and, and Carolyn, who's going to speak after me, is going to talk about this uh, in greater detail. Uh, we know that in midlife, high blood pressure actually uh, predicts um, vascular dementia, has a role in, in that, um, uh, in brain health. Uh, we know family history, if there's a maternal history and even a paternal, but with maternal having the greatest effect, you know, this is, these are all biomarkers, but could CVR be something that is included in that? And, you know, this time, we, you know, we're not sure from our end. And, but we do think that maybe it could be part of this missing puzzle piece. Is it something that we can consider and think about as we uh, look more into measures of brain health? So we completed a much larger data set. And again, that, that first aim was, was exploratory and the goal was to enroll 125 people. Uh, we did have 125 people, but I'm showing you data for 111. So either they didn't have an amyloid scan, maybe they didn't have an MRI scan, or maybe we just couldn't get uh, a TCD uh, strong signal, or maybe the data was too noisy that we had to eliminate people. But now we see 111 people in this graph. And I only show this graph again to show that, you know, what we saw before in 70 people, because sometimes you add and you get more variability. Uh, but we see the same trend that the more the amyloid load that you have that, um, again, um, the lower your cerebral vascular response, but also keeping in mind that there are some individuals who are non-elevated that have uh, a, a much lower response. So I decided to think about how could we look at this a little bit better. So in what I found in the literature is that there's a range for um, you know, the MCAV response with exercise, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent uh, change. So I decided to be a little bit more conservative and only went with a 10 percent change. So we took everybody's baseline and we took that, you know, and, and calculated what a 10 percent above their baseline would be and then compared it to what they actually did. 
And so we came up with about 4.86, uh, I believe, or 4.89 centimeters per second for this change. And we divided the groups all the way across, including everybody, you know, with ele elevated amyloid or not, and just went ahead and looked at this as a, as a dividing point. And I brought in uh, Dr. Robin Honey. She uh, actually does more um, regional analyses. And I, I really was curious um, at some different regional, not just global beta amyloid, but what about specific regions? And so when we divided these individuals, who I call an, um, you know, CVR normal and then CVR on the low end, we had 47 and, and 64. Uh, we see that they're uh, it's definitely trending towards a significant difference in age. Uh, BMI is not different. I'm not sure the age right here is clinically meaningful. Uh, education is very similar. And then their ASCVD risk score uh, was not different for, for these groups. So again, um, you know, we might have to tease out differently. You know, instead of just looking at the whole number, could we tease out something uh, about individual cardiovascular risk? And so between these uh, groups, again, we see, uh, you know, the whole brain beta amyloid differences. And, and you might say, well, most of the people who had elevated beta amyloid actually, you know, will probably make up the majority of the group. And that's uh, definitely a fair, fair criticism. But I also wanted to look at not just whole brain, but this is where Dr. Honey came in. And, and we showed that the default mode network, which uh, is all of us, you know, uh, those of you that are sitting on the session today or when you're, you know, maybe relaxing in a chair watching TV, maybe reading a book, um, sitting quietly, your brain will start to think about things, maybe about your internal self, how you feel, if you're tired. Um, and, and those are the areas that are most active, I guess, when we are at rest. And I always say, you know, is the brain really at rest? But um, we see these differences in the, the default mode network. And we're also looking at cognition because we, there were some differences in some of the tests. But again, I'm not a, a, a psychometrician. I'm not an expert in the COG test. But we're trying to see if any of the COG tests might relate to the default mode network. Um, I'm currently working with Dr. Honey right now just to, to look at maybe um, taking out those that are all elevated and then look at the same data in those that are, are non-elevated. Um, and interestingly, I can just give a little snippet here, but for everybody that's non-elevated in this group, so again, they, they fall below that 1.1, we do see differences. For those people with that low CVR, their default mode network actually has higher um, beta amyloid. And again, I just want to repeat that these are all the people who are uh, non-elevated. So again, you know, could CVR be a, a, a risk, or I'm sorry, not a risk, but a, a biomarker for overall brain health? And that's something that we don't know, but I'm very interested in exploring uh, with our team here at the KU Alzheimer's Disease Center. So um, in thinking about um, the, the, you know, what I've talked about so far, I, I really believe that there's a role for vascular health and whether it's going to be blood pressure, um, you know, and we already know that that is, it has some influence, um, really thinking about cerebrovascular response and, and the different ways that we can test it and coming up with this. Um, I think we need better vascular biomarkers. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's so exciting to think about this group. And I've heard, you know, many of these talks and, and some of the elegant studies that have been done and have been discussed so far. It's, there's really a unique opportunity, I think, even amongst this group to really challenge us, to rise to the occasion, to, to think about how we can consider vascular biomarkers and thinking about the preclinical AD and then in middle-aged adults where we can maybe potentially identify uh, issues and then try to intervene and close that gap so that we can, um, uh, you know, so that we can actually think about how we can prevent, um, you know, uh, or maintain brain health over the lifespan. Also, during this time, uh, I've, I have a, I've had this really great pleasure working um, on a multi-site R01 with Dr. Uh, Marmoralis or Vasalis Marmoralis uh, at USC and Rong Zeng at UT Southwestern. We have a multi-site R01 uh, where we're enrolling um, our, our individuals with normal cognition, uh, mild cognitive impairment, and also early Alzheimer's disease. 
And, um, you know, we have a protocol that we're doing, but I kind of put together some, some uh, beginnings of what I think could be a neurovascular battery with what we can do uh, within that study. And really, we're, gonna, we're moving forward to really implement this into the uh, P50 application going forward in 2020. So it's an ADRC, which is an Alzheimer's disease and related dementia renewal application for our center here at KU Med Center. And really see, you know, as we... You know, we have about, in our cohort, we have about 400 people that we follow longitudinally. We had people that we followed for about eight years and that we have some vascular data, but I want to put something together that's consistent and that we could do on multiple studies or that we could suggest that other investigators here do so that we can really get at this answer and, and put some uh, numbers behind it to really study that. So, Carolyn, I don't know if we have any questions on this before I transition to stroke. Is there anything burning, or should I just move on? Uh, there's no questions as yet, Sandy, okay. so you're welcome to uh, move on. Okay, thank you. So, you know, during this time uh, that we were doing this study, and, and this was actually in probably when we um, had about 50 or 60 people in on the prior study, you know, again, we were looking at this baseline measure, and then we were looking at this exercise response, and then calculating this difference. And as I said, I really like graphs, and I really like to look at the data. And all I had were was this number, you know, and I, I had a second number, and some were, you know, lower, and some didn't change much, and some changed a lot. And, and I really wanted to know, you know, where that piece was, and what did that look like when, when they started exercise, and, and how did that, how did that, um, change with the onset of exercise. And so I was very interested in, in trying to figure out as a way, if there was a way that we could look at this. And I looked at the literature and I didn't find a lot in the literature that, that's, that modeled this. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I started looking and thinking about, um, you know, people who had modeled um, data. And I, I have had the pleasure of working with you know, David Poole, he's been a little bit, of, uh, he's been a mentor um, of mine for a while on, on multiple occasions. I, I think I started, you know, networking with him at our local ACSM chapter, um, you know, late 90s. And, and so I knew he did modeling on oxygen uptake kinetics. And I take, took this image, um, you know, and, and, um, and, you know, just to show the, the group, and I'm sure most, some have seen this before, but, you know, you have this resting and you can see how the blood flow changes in the muscle. And so I was really curious, you know, can we even do this in the brain and, and, and what does that even look like? And so this is the very first, um, you know, data that we got. I mean, this is just the, the voltage on the side. We hadn't really you know, done anything with it. I just wanted to see what would it be look like, and was there a way that we could model this change that was was meaningful with that? And you know, we collected some some pilot data and had Dr. Poole come out, uh, come over to to KU Med Center and and work with us. We had him, you know, go through the protocol. You know, um, looked at his own data. We shared with what we had, and he he really felt like we had this opportunity to move and advance the field of of cerebrovascular uh, physiology, kind of looking at the data in a unique way. So, um, what we've done in our past data is we do a familiar, which we've always done in all of our studies. We do a familiarization where we set them the individuals all up, uh, and we identify the workload that we need to reach the target heart rate. Again, we have them sitting and resting. Uh, we go for about 20 minutes, um, and again, we redefined our, our moderate intensity exercise. And so, our baseline is 90 seconds for these studies. I've been thinking about extending that a little bit more. Uh, and then we have the exercise onset. And then we, um, you know, have them exercise once they, they start for six minutes. Now, in the healthy young people doing three transitions, you know, we give them rest, let the values come back down. Um, doing three transitions isn't difficult for the young healthy, but for our older adults who are sedentary, uh, that we bring in, we do two transitions just because they get really tired or they they decline to, to do the third. And so we always, for our clinical populations, we do, excuse me, two transitions um, for our older adults and clinical uh, populations. And then we average those uh, together. 
<clears throat> so this is the first paper that we published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And again, we had more people enrolled in this, this study, uh, but the graph that you're looking at is only data for uh, one person. And so here we, you see we have our resting data. Um, you know, why does Adobe have to pop up right when I'm, there we go, um, speaking. Uh, so there's rest, there's our exercise uh, onset uh, here at time zero. And then you can see this is a, um, a healthy, active young adult and, and we have a sedentary older adult and then we have an individual who was age and sex matched to the sedentary older adult. Um, and, and so again, for me, I, I love the visualization, but you can see a much, uh, you know, you can see how uh, the uh, uh, blood velocity goes up with the onset of exercise, whereas in the older adult, it's a little bit slower, not uh, quite as great. And then the individual with stroke, uh, again, you can see a much more blunted response or really almost no response uh, to that exercise bout. So, we moved on and, and went ahead and collected data and published this data uh, in 2018, but we, we looked at the uh, younger uh, adults, which there were 15, and we brought in 15 older adults. And uh, you can see that their baseline uh, MCAV is definitely lower for the older adults. Um, amplitude is, is lower. Uh, it takes a little bit longer for it to reach, uh, you know, that 80% of the, the curve. And then the time delay is, um, was a little bit quicker. Uh, when we look at this data and as we've, you know, I think there is something to time delay. And I think about this almost like I do the flow mediated dilation, that there is this delay before you see the, the vascular response. And as we've gotten more people in and we're building a database um, of individuals um, with different backgrounds uh, as far as, um, you know, age and uh, fitness level. And we see that that time delay on average is about 55 seconds. So I would say anywhere from 45 to 55 seconds is what we're seeing as, as an average response. Um, and then the work rate, obviously, for the older adults is, is a little bit uh, less. And so again, here, just this just depicts this for the, the older adults. <clears throat> So after, you know, we had looked at all this, I felt like we had, um, you know, before you start, you know, delving into the clinical populations, they're a lot harder to recruit. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure we had something uh, solid for our, um, for our study before we started bringing in people with stroke and really understood that response and spent the time really thinking about these data before uh, we did that. So moving on to uh, post-stroke. So it's really interesting. As I was, you know, in, in, in school and working with people post-stroke, it, it's hard to believe, but exercise was contraindicated for stroke recovery. And this was really um, centered on the fact that they thought that exercise or activity that was too intense would actually make their, um, if they had any spasticity or tone in their limb, uh, that it would actually make it worse. And I'm not sure what the evidence was for that. I have a feeling that that was probably um, more observational, but we know that that's not true anymore. It's hard to believe uh, that we ever thought the brain was plastic given what we know now, um, but it was thought, you know, again, I had textbooks I was studying from that the brain doesn't change and that it's plastic, and we know that that's not true anymore either. However, you know, compared to the cardiovascular literature, people with stroke and neurological diseases is, 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 you know, really moving to the forefront, especially with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so exercise for brain health is really understudied, and this is an exciting area to really think about. You know, can we prevent vascular dementia? Uh, there also has been a you know, a, a very rapid, I would say, uh, adoption of, of thinking about high intensity. And, you know, in some of the literature, you'll see high intensity locomotor training. And this is really based on their fastest walking speed. And again, if they have motor deficits, it's really hard to get them up to those um, heart rate ranges like we can do in maybe older adults um, or in people who are able-bodied or don't have um, any uh, disability in motor function. Um, but some people do look at interval exercise uh, for people with stroke, 
Uh, and so, you know, I've read with great interest some of the review papers that have been done in, in really questioning, and I think rightly so, is that is high intensity exercise with those rapid changes in blood pressure, is that something that people with neurological conditions and especially people with stroke, is that something that, um, you know, it should it be contraindicated? Do we need to study it more? Which I, I believe that we do need to, to really look at that more. And, and what, how does the, the brain respond? And so we, we, we are not answering a question on high intensity in, in this study, um, but we did want to really uh, characterize what that MCV dynamic response to exercise at three and six months post-stroke would, would look like. Uh, again, this hasn't, hasn't been done, and so there was really no data to power this off of and, um, and, and really you know, what to, uh, to expect. <clears throat> so we hypothesized that the MCAV uh, dynamic response uh, with moderate intensity exercise would be greatest at six months post-stroke. And the reason that we did that is there has been some literature that suggests that cardiorespiratory fitness changes over time in people with stroke and that at six months to a year, well, actually between six months and a year, it stabilizes, but from the time they have their stroke to about six months, it actually goes up. And so we thought, well, if, you know, brain health is related to, you know, cardiorespiratory fitness, maybe we would see the, the same thing. And so that was our hypothesis. And we thought that, and again, we didn't know how many people would be physically active after their stroke, but if they were, we figured that physical activity would be related to some of our outcome measures. So this is how uh, our recruitment or inclusion criteria and that we recruited people 35 to 95 years of age. Uh, it was really important that we made sure on imaging that they had a unilateral ischemic stroke because we were going to compare both sides. We needed to make sure that the stroke was uh, unilateral. Uh, we also had a radiologist uh, confirm that carotid stenosis was less than 70% on some type of imaging, whether it was an MRA scan or ultrasound, they would confirm that, send us a note, and uh, then we would um, call them to get them scheduled if they met all the uh, other criteria. And then you can uh, kind of look through and look at the uh, exclusion criteria. <clears throat> So unfortunately, we'd found no significant differences uh, for outcome measures at three and six months uh, post-stroke. Uh, we also found no differences between gender or race. However, I would um, suggest that uh, this may be due to our, our low uh, sample size. So we had enrolled, uh, gosh, now I can't remember how many we enrolled. It's 30 30 something, we ended up with 26 in this data set. Uh, again, it was just, we couldn't find a, a window um, or their data was, was too messy to be included in the uh, analysis. So even though, I, again, there was no differences between these three and six months uh, data, we, um, we started looking at, you know, some people didn't respond in the typical way, you know, kind of like the individual who uh, was in that original graph where there was such a low response that it, the, the equation doesn't work and it can't model. And, you know, we thought long and hard about this and this, you know, it could be a, a weakness of, you know, the design is, you know, what if people can't model? You know, we don't want to throw out a bunch of data, but I, again, I just feel like there is something about these people when I graph them, that there is some information that we could glean from that. And so what we did was then, you know, and, the, and again, this is post-analysis, this wasn't a, a forward uh, analysis, but we divided those people into uh, responders, those people who modeled and, and fit the model, and those people who did not. And so we had, again, uh, 12 and 10 people in, in, in these groups. Um, <clears throat> And so you can see here what uh, the, the number, uh, the percent of people who fell into race, ethnicity category or gender. Um, and I'd just like to point out that really between these two groups of people, and again, I realize that it's small and that's a, a limitation uh, to the study, but in things that we, we typically look at, um, you know, BMI, um, lesion size, um, I don't have, we have a lot more data. We have lesion location. We had whether they got TPA, thrombectomy, a combination of both. 
uh, the stroke location, and none of those things uh, were different. We looked at how they felt about their disability, and that wasn't significantly different, nor was the functional test, although the non-responders certainly had a much lower um, number, uh, a lot of variability between groups. This was not significantly different. But what we did see is that their physical activity score uh, was definitely higher for those who had a greater response. And, um, you know, we, we, again, for the study, we didn't do uh, maximal exercise testing, but we did an estimated value, and um, that was different, significantly different as well. And although not on here, none of the blood pressure medications they were on were significant. Uh, one medication that I didn't think about that was significantly different is those um, who were responders were actually ta reported taking uh, a statin medication, which we know that statins are, are good for overall vascular health. So the results of, of this study, um, you know, this is now under re-review, re I should have said re-review. We've addressed some of the uh, reviewer's comments, um, and so it's hopefully we'll hear soon. Um, but if you look at the filled in um, uh, dots, you know, we see here is the, the non-stroke affected vessel. So again, it has a really nice response in, in these individuals uh, post-stroke. And unfortunately, the, the stroke affected vessel is a little bit um, masked by the, the uh, non-affected side. But again, I, we were really surprised to see this much of a, a response in, in the people post-stroke. So then in the people that we had, the, the non-responders, you know, you see their data is a little bit noisier, but you see this rapid increase in their MCAV response at the start of exercise. And then it comes back down and we can see a little bit of how, how much this um, kind of changes and is kind of has a rippled effect uh, across that. And so we're not, and the data is not, so we censor our data, and so it's not just noisy data, but you can see in a couple people where we have sort of the, the, that, that trend where it kind of goes up and down, and I'm, I'm sure that this is due to blood pressure changes, and we're working on getting this data together and really looking at the blood pressure and, and either thinking about CVCI or maybe modeling the blood pressure data to really see, you know, if people have this rapid response, you know, is there something about them that would be unique? Uh, would they benefit most from exercise? Would they not benefit from high intensity exercise? Um, you know, this was continuous, and so trying to understand that a little bit better. So during the study, I wanted to share this case report. If you haven't looked at it, it was a fascinating opportunity for us to uh, study something very unique. Um, you know, we had a case report where one of our participants who was coming in had a stroke, um, you know, around the May, and then he actually came back a year later, and while we were still recruiting for the study, and he had a stroke on the opposite MCA. And so we were able to actually report on the influence of stroke, um, you know, on MCAV. And so just because I want to get to the other speakers, I'm going to kind of roll through this pretty fast, and I'm just going to go through all of these. <clears throat> but again, you know, this individual was a cyclist before his stroke and um, was very physically active, getting back to activity before um, when he came back in. And so he looks better than some of the older adults that we have. But we do see differences between the, the right and left side. And you can see at the six month visit, so visit one is three months post stroke, visit two is six months. So again, you can see that you know, he was still active, and, um, but there was a little bit of decrease from his baseline uh, measure. And if we look at visit three, this is uh, three months after his second stroke, they almost look identical. So you can see the effect that stroke has on uh, this MCAV response. And again, this is in the middle cerebral artery for him. Uh, and then by visit four, uh, you know, he reported really mostly watching TV, not doing much. It, it, I believe it was also fairly cold um, when we brought him back in. I was thinking it was like November. Uh, so it could be due to, you know, the winter months and not being as physically active. But again, big difference uh, in that side following the stroke. So if you're interested, um, you know, Carolyn, uh, give her credit to writing all this up for us and taking the lead on this case study, but it's a really interesting uh, case study that's 
published in Physiologic Reports. So future directions and stroke. I think we need to understand the short-term uh, effects of different exercise intensities, especially if we want to think about stroke prevention, um, you know, secondary stroke prevention. Uh, we need to understand how people with stroke respond to low, moderate, and high intensity exercise, um, and, and really understanding continuous versus interval, and it could be moderate uh, interval training, um, not necessarily just high, but how do they respond, and do we need to increase that sheer stress from the up-down, you know, the intervals to actually see vascular benefit? I, you know, there's a lot that we can do in this area and really understand what that, that immediate or that acute effect is. And then obviously looking at the long-term benefits of exercise on brain health from duration and intensity uh, that could uh, benefit brain health. So again, if we're interested uh, in, in understanding better uh, how we could prevent um, vascular dementia in this group and maintain cognitive uh, health, I think it's something that we um, need to look at. There has been literature on exercise, overall brain health, and the neuroplasticity for recovery. So, you know, in the stroke, uh, you know, model, you know, should we be intervening? You know, we actually looked at all these data at three months post-stroke, but should we look at one month or should we look at this side-by-side -side with physical therapy intervention or rehabilitation techniques is something to think about. And Again, you know, we've just done a characterization, but we really need to start diving into the mechanisms of, of what could be um, occurring in these individuals and maybe look more closely at, at various risk factors or medication, um, things like that. Um, and I think that's gonna be really important as we move the field forward to think about how do we reduce secondary stroke or prevent vascular dementia. So with that, I really wanna thank um, Pat and Caroline for this, um, and the Carnet uh, group for supporting these seminars. I, as I mentioned, they've just been an absolute um, fun just to sit here and think, listen, and hear what everybody's doing and learn from everybody. Um, you know, I get to always present all this um, work and have fun with it. And, um, but really, it's, it's the lab team who, who really helps me drive all this forward and does such a great job. And especially during this time with COVID and they're, you know, working in the lab and getting our participants seen. So I owe them a, a, a big thank you for all their work. And then our collaborators, the physicians, our stroke team, the Alzheimer's Dis Disease Center, and the study participants who are constantly willing to come in and and do some of our, our um, batteries and things that we do, and then the funding and sources. So at this time, I'd be happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you so much, Sandy. That was an excellent presentation. Um, it's generated a lot of questions here. So um, <laughs> I'll try and get through a few of these, but if you'd like to respond later in the chat feature, that's also an opportunity for you. Um, okay. So I'll just start off, and the first few are from the stroke portion of your talk. Um, so first okay. one from Justin Sprick, it's a two part question. Um, he's, Justin says, interesting talk, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one, how does the cerebrovascular response to exercise relate to other indices of cerebrovascular function, such as auto regulation or re reactivity to CO2? And then I'll ask a second part once you've responded to that one. You know, I, so <clears throat> there's been uh, a lot of work uh, more in autoregulation, not from my lab team, but actually in the acute stroke setting. Um, and so, again, there's a lot of information within that early window that shows an impairment in autoregulation from, from the start. Um, so, so we know that there's an impairment and we're likely seeing this, you know, this response and exercise is probably carryover from that. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, the response to CO2, uh, if you look at some of the early work by Rich Macko, uh, Fred Ivey was the lead on this, uh, and some uh, other individuals, we know that the vasomotor reactivity to CO2 is, is also impaired. Um, that's not something that I have in the lab right now. We're working on, on moving that, that forward uh, as part of our multi-site trial in Alzheimer's disease. And so our lab may have the capability uh, of, of, of looking at that, but it, it's, it's impaired early within those acute stages. And maybe it never really recovers or comes back to a normal. Uh, but again, can we look at these things to try to characterize uh, I, I use exercise as a physical therapist because, um, you know, and I, and I also led the exercise recommendations, that paper for the American Heart Association. And so exercise is really something that we need to, to really 
encourage stroke patients to, to do. And so I, I, you know, understanding how they respond to exercises is, is important and certainly not um, suggesting or diminishing the role of, of CO2 or the autoregulation. Uh, but I, again, I think we have to have that whole complete picture to really make, to understand and move our field forward. Second part. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that in terms of, uh, you know, there's different tests maybe assessing different uh, parts of vascular functions. So yep. I think having a comprehensive understanding is important. Yeah, I agree. Um, the second part of the, Justin's question is, uh, do you know if the cerebrovascular response to exercise that you characterized on the stepper also mirrors the response exhibited during other forms of exercise, such as cycling or walking? Well, you know, I, I, so I was that specific in stroke? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we, you know, walking would be ideal. Uh, the hard part to do that is, um, you know, motor function. If they have a hemiparetic gait, which those are the people we want to study because they're at most risk for not moving. It's, it's hard to get them up to those speeds on the treadmill. And if you've watched somebody with a stroke, especially, you know, in our study where we are doing hit and moderate intensity, you know, sometimes that leg lags. And, and so we, there's just so much going on in their body movement that I'm not, I think we'd have more noise than we would signal. Um, but on the bike, I, you know, I, I think I saw a talk and I want to say it came out of Chris, is it Askew's lab? I think somebody was coming up to Phil Ainsley's, the, the talk at, in Canada, the spring, which I was looking forward to. And I think they did some work on cycle and, and modeling the dynamic response. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't get to see that talk. So I'm not sure. I've only looked at the stepper. I wouldn't expect it to be different on a cycle versus a stepper with the caveat that, you know, with the stepper, what we did because of the resistance and the load, and I assume you'd see this on the, the bike, but if they have to overcome a lot of resistance and they Valsalva, the blood pressure drops, the, the MCAV drops, and then the curve is lower. We saw this. And so we, you know, if you read our papers, we do a very quick 10 second continuous increase everybody increases at the same rate, one third, one third, one third, to get them to their heart rate for that six minutes. So, um, you know, I wouldn't expect it to be different, but that's a, you know, that's a great area for, you know, people to look at and for us to advance the field in that area. Absolutely. Thanks, Justin. Great. Um, next, next question from Jeffrey Dunn. Um, did the TCD derived changes, sorry, TCD velocity changes relate to changes in blood pressure? And did changes in blood pressure with exercise relate to the beta amyloid? Oh, okay. Sorry, I was in the stroke. So my mind was, can you say that again? So this is uh, whether the, the velocity changes related to blood pressure and did the changes in blood pressure with exercise relate to the beta amyloid load? So that is something, you know, I have not looked at yet. Um, again, we've, we've, we really wanted to capture and put our flag in the sand on the amyloid load. Nobody had really looked at the elevated amyloid and the, the, the uh, MCAV response. So I, you know, again, when we just looked at whole group differences, uh, they were similar, um, you know, with the, even with the 111 people, when we have our full data set, when we divide them into groups, they're not different between there, but I would assume that if we looked at certain people, maybe with the greatest risk, perhaps blood pressure or other measures might be different. And, and um, you know, again, uh, I think that's an area where we really need to, to look at people and maybe go back. And, you know, if we think about it, I always find that the people on both ends of the spectrum always give you the most information. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at maybe those people with the, the highest amyloid load, maybe we need to look at blood pressure or other things that are unique about them to try to get at vascular risk. But again, the, the field is just so, you know, I mean, it's just a great place for all of us that are interested in this work to, to really move that forward. And, and the questions that we're generating here in these seminars are just fantastic. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll pass you on to the, I'll pass the questions on to you as well later so you can <laughs> see what other questions are being asked. Um, okay. uh, but just a couple more. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Um, Andrew Robertson uh, says, great talk, Sandy. Did you try restricting your amyloid, amyloid burden score to the MCA perfusion territory? Um, so, sorry, oh, this is not stroke. Um, no, this is, yeah, this is the AD stuff. 
So I think I might need some clarification. What do you mean by... So whether you can restrict the uh, calculating the amyloid burden score just to the region that's perfused oh. by the MCA? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I understand now. Um, yes. Um, we are in the process of looking at, at those regions. They don't perfectly align with... Um, I, we, we thought about that, and actually that's an excellent question, and I, I've, I've been talking with, again, Dr. Honey and some others who do uh, a lot more detailed imaging with those scans, um, and, and somebody made the, the, the point to me, and I'd be curious as what others think, and so I brought that up, you know, if we could localize it to the MCA territory, should we think about this, and, and somebody had asked me back, well, you look at blood pressure in one arm and make an assumption about the whole body. Why do you care if it's regional, you know, localized to the MCAV? And I thought that was a really good question. And I said, well, but, but if, you know, you know, that's the main vessel, you know, that's going to feed kind of the, the area of the, the brain moving forward. And, and I wanted to think about that in executive function. And so that's where, you know, again, we're in these early stages of trying to put together the default mode network. We do have amyloid in each individual region, like the anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, um, medial lateral, you know, temporal lobe. And so actually just trying to think about um, executive function and where the MCA delivers. So yes, that's a good question. We have thought about it. I, d I don't have an answer for you now because we're actually looking at that data as we speak. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Uh, just one last question, uh, just with the time kind of ticking by. Um, Jess uh, Steventon asks, um, did the heart rate reserve achieved of the exercise relate to the CVR in both groups? So did the exercise achieve? So they they so we have published on this, and uh, there were no differences. Uh, again, is this? I'm sorry. Is this the older adults? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's. I'm not sure. It just talk, talks about the um, heart rate reserve. Um, okay. The, so the exercise the older, intensity and the the CVR results. Yeah. So they were related. So, so for the older adults, um, so if we look at. Uh, you know, the workload in the older adults is definitely different than the younger adults, and I'm sure that that has an effect on there. But that's, you know, part of aging. We know that heart rate goes down. Um, you know, if we look at the, the individuals with stroke, uh, I will tell you that, you know, in the paper that with the Ameri Journal of American Heart Association, we do uh, show that the workload between the non-responders and responders is different. And I'm sure that that has something to, to do with that, uh, driving, you know, that the, the MCAV. I have no doubt that that does. However, I, I think that also speaks to, um, you know, again, the age wasn't different between them. And if these individuals are sedentary, um, you know, can we get them to a greater workload to help perfusion? Because we know that if you exercise more, you have a better, a better response to a, to a upper ceiling or to a point. But, you know, can we take those people who are sedentary and, and push them forward? If you're looking, if the question was specific to the group with beta amyloid, uh, the workload was not different between those groups. Um, and we were able to get all of the older adults in, into uh, their heart rate, rate zone. Um, you know, they were sedentary. So we had a wide, they had to be sedentary to be enrolled into the study. That was one of the criterias. Um, so we had a, a wide range of uh, workload f in those groups with elevated amyloid and not. So, yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much, Sandy. We really appreciate your talk this morning. Um, and I will forward those other questions to you or you can answer them uh, through the chat feature if you like um, okay. during, during sure. the session. So I'm going to pass off to you now to chair the rest of the session with your uh, abstract talks. So thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you all for the great questions. I look forward to reading through those. And I would always like to say, you know, our group is highly collaborative. So if anyone has ideas or wants to look at ways in which we could advance the field and maybe you have a certain way, I'm certainly open to collaborating and, and, and working through questions with others that may have experience in areas that I, that I don't. Um, so I am very excited to um, hear the next talk. Uh, this will be done by uh, Carolyn, who's an MD, PhD student working in my lab, and I don't want to uh, take any more time. So, Carolyn, it's the floor is yours. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. The laser pointer. 
So today I'm going to <clears throat> show you some unpublished data from my dissertation projects looking at how Alzheimer's disease risk factors are related to the cerebrovascular response to aerobic exercise in older adults. So the vast majority of research on Alzheimer's disease has centered around the amyloid hypothesis, which is this idea that aggregates of protein called beta amyloid deposit in the brain. And that's the initial primary cause of Alzheimer's that leads to everything else downstream. Uh, however, there's been recent studies that have suggested vascular dysfunction may play an even earlier role than beta amyloid in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, this study that included almost 8,000 brain scans found that vascular changes shown in orange, uh, so essentially this is reduced cerebral blood flow, uh, occur earlier than all of the other brain abnormalities they considered, including beta amyloid deposition shown in red. And other changes tend to occur even later, such as reduced metabolism or structural atrophy in the brain. So this suggests cerebrovascular dysfunction may be an important early mechanism in Alzheimer's pathogenesis. The strongest known genetic risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease is the apolipoprotein E4 allele or ApoE4. And although vascular influences of ApoE4 have also been relatively overlooked historically, uh, there is increasing evidence that ApoE4 may cause Alzheimer's disease at least partially through cerebrovascular dysfunction. So, for example, E4 carriers have been shown to have a greater age-related decline in cerebral blood flow. And among people with Alzheimer's disease, E4 carriers have lower cerebral blood flow than the non-carriers. So the analyses I'll discuss next were designed to kind of probe this relationship further. So just briefly, we recruited cognitively normal sedentary older adults to come to our lab and we recorded the middle cerebral artery velocity using TCD, a beat to beat blood pressure with the finopress in tidal CO2 through nasal cannula, both at seated rest for eight minutes and then during eight minutes of steady state moderate intensity exercise. And for my outcome of interest, I decided to use the percent change in middle cerebral artery velocity instead of the raw difference because although not significant, the resting velocities were a bit different for the E4 carriers and non-carriers. So this method accounts for that. And considering this idea that ApoE4 may act mechanistically through vascular pathways to cause Alzheimer's disease, my hypothesis was that the change in MCAB with an acute bout of exercise would be smaller in the E4 carriers compared to the non-carriers. And I also expected to see that same relationship from our previous paper that is that that beta amyloid deposition would be negatively associated with the change in MCAV from rest to exercise. So I ran a multiple linear regression analysis controlling for age, sex, exercising carbon dioxide, and exercising blood pressure. And as I expected, and in line with our previous work, uh, higher beta amyloid load was associated with significantly lower percent change in MCAV with exercise. Uh, however, for my hypothesis about E4 carrier status as uh, can happen in science, I actually found the exact opposite of what I expected. So our data suggests that E4 carriers actually have a significantly larger percent change in MCAV from rest to exercise compared to the non-carriers. And here I'm showing there was no interaction between the E4 allele and beta amyloid load on the percent change in MCAV. So you can see that E4 carriers generally have a larger percent change in MCAV for any particular level of beta amyloid deposition, but the slopes of the two lines are very similar. So indicating that the negative relationship between beta amyloid and the exercise response is similar for both E4 carriers and non-carriers. So to recap, uh, as expected, my analysis showed higher beta amyloid deposition in the brain was associated with an attenuated cerebral blood velocity response to exercise uh, however, contrary to my hypothesis, the E4 carriers actually had a significantly larger percent change in MCAV with exercise than the non-carriers. So the next question is, how do we explain these findings? And I'm interested to hear any thoughts and, and discussion from everyone on, on here today about this, but I'll put forward a couple of my own ideas that I don't necessarily think would have to be mutually exclusive. So my first thought is that maybe our sample just includes particularly healthy E4 carriers. You know, considering these are people uh, mostly in their 70s who have maintained normal cognition despite having this high genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
And my, my other idea is that this larger response might actually predict cerebrovascular benefits from aerobic exercise. So basically, instead of thinking of the percent change as a sort of readout or like an indication of cerebrovascular health, uh, maybe it could also be understood to predict which individuals might benefit most from exercise interventions. So in support of that first idea, although not significant, the E4 carriers in our sample do appear to have relatively better systemic vascular health than the non-carriers based on these metrics. And so despite the fact that the E4 allele usually increases risk of atherosclerosis and, and other cardiovascular diseases in, in large population studies, in our particular sample, the E4 carriers actually tended toward a healthier cardiovascular profile. So maybe for whatever reason, whether through medication or diet or modifier genes, these particular E4 carriers in our sample <clears throat> have been able to compensate for their increased Alzheimer's risk by maintaining even better peripheral and also cerebrovascular health, which is manifested in that larger cerebrovascular response to exercise. And, and maybe that's also why they have normal cognition. However, as I mentioned earlier, although not significant, the E4 carriers in the sample did have a bit lower resting MCAV compared to the non-carriers. So that, that part kind of stands in contrast to, these, to the other measures. So the second potential explanation occurred to me as I was analyzing a, a different data set and I found some pretty interesting preliminary results. So APEX stands for Alzheimer's Prevention Through Exercise. And, and this was a year-long clinical trial when, run by KU's Alzheimer's Disease Center that consisted of an aerobic exercise intervention in cognitively normal older adults. And I had the opportunity to analyze the cerebral blood flow data that was collected before and after the year-long intervention period. And so and through my analysis, I found that the exercise intervention significantly improved blood flow to the hippocampus, which is a brain structure that's particularly important for Alzheimer's disease, for the E4 carriers, but not for the non-carriers. And as you can see, the E4 carriers who exercised on average improved hippocampal blood flow, while the E4 carriers in the control group actually had decreased blood flow to the hippocampus over that year. And in, in, in contrast, there was no difference in the change in hippocampal blood flow over that year for the non-carriers uh, between the exercise and the control groups. So I won't, I won't get into this any further since this is a separate study, but overall these preliminary findings from the APEX clinical trial suggest that aerobic exercise may preferentially improve uh, cerebrovascular health in the APOE4 carriers. So considering this evidence from my preliminary analysis of the APEX trial, it occurred to me that maybe that larger acute change in MCAV from rest to exercise in the, in the E4 carriers in our other study predicts that E4 carriers will experience more beneficial chronic cerebrovascular adaptations with regular exercise. And uh, this sort of ties back to one of the earlier sessions in this seminar series led by Dr. Sam Lucas and his team. And this, this figure that I think has been shown a few times in these talks, um, I'm thinking that perhaps our data could tie into this and that that larger percent change in MCAV could mean E4 carriers, for example, experience more shear stress in the cerebrovasculature during aerobic exercise and that this this primes the E4 carriers to have greater cerebrovascular adaptations from aerobic exercise. And then this explanation would be in line with the benefits that I found in my preliminary analysis of the APEX clinical trial. So I think this could be an interesting route for future investigation. So thank you to everyone who made this research possible, the REACH Lab, my PhD mentor, Dr. Sandy Billinger, and the rest of our team, uh, the KU Alzheimer's Disease Center, and everyone there we collaborate with very closely. Uh, thanks to the funding sources. Thank you to the organizers, uh, Dr. Brassard, Dr. Ricards, and a finally huge thank you to all the awesome participants who make our research possible. So I'm happy to take any questions. Do I just look in the chat? Hey, Sandy, you there? Um, Carolyn, I can I can ask you this one question here from uh, Heather Edgel. Um, she says, apologies if I missed this, but did you combine the APOE4 homozygous carriers with heterozygous carriers? Would you anticipate a difference if you separated them? Yeah, so we actually just happen to not have any homozygotes. Uh, that's a 
really good question. I did exclude the E2 carriers since E2 can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, um, but it just so happened that all of the E4 carriers that we that we had were E4, E3. And so this, this would just be people who are either E3, E3 or E3, E4 genotype. But I would, to answer what, what would I expect, it would be really interesting if we had some and then, and could see if the, you know, having two E4 alleles actually magnifies this, what we, what we observed. Absolutely. Great. No wonder I didn't unmute. Oh, thank Boy, you. I'm, real, I'm, I'm not very good at this. I'm sorry. I lose my job. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass back over to you, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is from uh, Patrice. Nice talk, Carolyn. Did you monitor changes in blood pressure and PET CO2 during acute exercise in this study? If yes, did you see difference in these variables between groups? Any difference in DCA or cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2 between groups? So I didn't look at DCA or cerebrovascular reactivity. Uh, we did monitor the a CO2 and, and MAP with the Finipress. So I included that in the, in the regression model just to account for it. And I was kind of interested in that too, like just to give you an idea of the association between those, those variables for the carriers and non-carriers. This is just a rough uh, graph from MATLAB of our, our data. But I thought this was interesting. This was not significant when I made this an interaction term. Um, so that would suggest that these lines are actually not significantly different, but they sure look different to me uh, with the with the carriers having this kind of positive association with the change in map during exercise and the non-carriers having a negative association. Um, but with CO2, they looked uh, pretty much similar. But again, these this was not significant, so uh, I didn't include it in the in the final model because it actually worsened uh, the predicted value. All right. So um, I'm just going to read this to you from Just Stevenson. Carolyn, interesting results regarding your direction of effects in APOE4. We also found an increase in CBF measured with ASL MRI in response to exercise with our disease group, Huntington's disease, with no change in healthy match controls. You might, she gives you a DOI. Uh, you might want to go check that out. We oh. thought perhaps exercise was challenging the vascular system sufficiently to reveal latent pathology not evident at rest, but wel would welcome any uh, results. Um, let's see. La one last uh, question. Th Kurt Smith, thanks, Carolyn. I think to identify the correct interpretation of the mechanism responsible for the higher MCAV response in APOE4, a comprehensive cerebral vascular battery is needed, as suggested by yourself and myself. Um, despite this, I'm curious to hear if you think the CBF response in the APOE4 plus is because of a tighter matching of CBF to metabolism during exercise or another regulatory mechanism, CO2, blood pressure, uh, SNA, that may alter tone? Uh, metabolism is a pretty interesting thought there. You know, perhaps they're having more activation, increased metabolism, and, and that is drawing in more blood. Uh, the CO2 and blood pressure are kind of what I was just showing uh, with the other with the other question and I didn't you know there might be this different association but it at least wasn't significant and I agree about the a comprehensive battery so for my the other part of my dissertation we're actually with that uh, with that multi-site R01 that Dr. Billinger mentioned uh, we're bringing in people with Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls and doing sit to stand and also measuring their blood flow at rest and I'll be asking some of these same questions about E4 carrier status. So we'll be genotyping all of them too. Uh, I just haven't, I don't have that, that data yet, but that should kind of help us understand this, this better. Great. I think we need to move on. You might want to look uh, uh, through the chat, Carolyn, and uh, look and see what else is there for you. Uh, but moving on now, uh, Allison, uh, Whitaker, uh, she's a PhD student uh, working here in my lab, and um, she's going to give the next presentation. Allison? All right. Thank you. Um, so like Dr. Billinger said, I am a second year PhD student. Um, I'm also a physical therapist. Um, and today I was interested um, in reporting on um, my uh, my study looking at acute stroke mobility and whether um, it can influence exercise middle cerebral artery velocity during stroke recovery. Um, so during an acute um, hospital stay post-stroke, individuals spend about 95% of their time either laying down in bed or sitting in bed. 
Um, and this is extremely important because physical activity has been shown um, to help with stroke outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of rehabilitation and recovery trials looking at the optimal amount of physical activity for these individuals after stroke. Um, so here at the University of Kansas Medical Center, um, an interdisciplinary team of stroke physicians, nurses, and rehab specialists have implemented a tracker that reports on the physical activity and walking that these individuals do um, during their acute stroke hospital stay. Oops, sorry. There we go. During their acute hospital stay. Um, and this is important for clinicians because they're able to look at this farthest distance walk that these individuals are able to do and that helps inform them on their discharge recommendations such as whether these individuals can go home or whether they need further rehabilitation um, in an inpatient unit um, and so i was um, really excited about this and i wanted to look at this physical activity after stroke um, because previous studies have shown that with Aging across, um, with aging, physical activity um, can improve brain health. And um, I one measure of looking at brain health is looking at that middle cerebral artery blood velocity. So um, Dr. Billinger has already kind of introduced our setup in the REACH lab, um, but today I'm gonna report on our results that we did in individuals at three months post-stroke. So we were able to measure their middle cerebral artery blood velocity and their stroke affected hemisphere. Um, and we also continuously measured blood pressure, um, CO2, heart rate, and they performed moderate intensity exercise on a recumbent step. So here um, is a graph from our previously published manuscript um, looking at individuals three months post stroke who are the filled in dots and then um, their age and sex match controls, who are the open dots. Um, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the middle cerebral artery blood velocity. So to the left of time zero, that is our 90-second resting MCAV, and then to the right of time zero is the onset of moderate intensity exercise. And we're specifically interested in looking, in, in looking at the cerebral vascular response or this change in MCAV which is taking that steady state exercise MC, MCAV minus the resting MCAV. Um, and it's especially important to look at stroke um, because here at resting, um, there were no significant differences between their age and sex match controls and in the individuals post-stroke. Um, however, like Dr. Billinger was talking about, when we challenge the system with moderate intensity exercise, um, the individuals with stroke had a blunted response compared to um, their age and sex match controls. Um, so I'm specifically interested in looking at MCAV and stroke um, because it has been uh, shown to be associated with self-care outcomes, such as the FIM scores. Um, so the ability for an individual to independently get dressed on their own, uh, perform bed mobility, walking, stairs. Um, and MCAV is also associated with cognitive function. Um, so I'm interested in looking at this in individuals with stroke. So my objective of this study um, was to investigate whether this farthest distance walked in an acute stroke hospital stay um, would be associated with these measures of MCAV um, at three months post-stroke. So I hypothesized that individuals who walked greater than the average split, um, which was 360 feet, and this is a group that I'll call FAR+, plus, um, I hypothesized that they would have a greater resting middle cerebral artery blood velocity and a greater percent change in that middle cerebral artery blood velocity compared to the individuals who walked less than the average split or 360 feet, which is the far minus group. I also then wanted to explore whether this farthest distance walked would be positively associated with this percent change in MCAV. Um, so this was a secondary analysis, a retrospective analysis of a prospective study. Um, so our prospective study uh, had these individuals come in at three months post-stroke where we did our kinetic recording of their middle cerebral artery blood velocity, um, where it started with 90 seconds of rest, and then we did six minutes of moderate intensity exercise. Um, however, I was then interested 
and looking in at um, their stroke hospital stay and specifically that tracker of walking during their admission stay um, post-stroke. So here's an example of what this tracker looks like. So this individual um, got up and walked three different times throughout the day. Um, however, two of the times were roughly 10 to 25 feet, um, which could have just been going to the restroom. However, um, they did get up and walk 200 feet, which would have been their farthest distance that they were able to walk during that day. Um, but I was interested in looking at um, overall during the entire admission stay, how far were these individuals able to walk? Um, so once again, I split these groups based on the average split, so 360 feet. Um, those who walked greater are the far plus group, and those who walked less than 360 were the far minus group. Um, so looking at the participant characteristics, there were no differences in age, sex, um, their time post-stroke at our three-month visit for NCAV recording, um, body mass index, beta blockers, um, their length of hospital stay was not different, their lesion size, uh, whether they received tissue plasminogen activator or TPA, which is a clot busting medication, or whether they received a thrombectomy, which is a surgical intervention to remove blood clots. Um, however, farthest distance walked was significantly different between groups, but this would be expected because this is how I split the groups. Um, but the FAR plus on average walked about 500 feet, while the FAR minus group walked about 125 feet. So here we're looking at the results of the blood velocity. So at rest, there um, it was not statistically significant. However, when looking at it, I knew I wanted to control for that, um, control for the resting between groups. So I did a percent change in MCAV. Um, and those who walked a farther distance had a higher response to the moderate intensity exercise compared to the individuals who walked um, less during the acute hospital stay. Um, I also, it's not shown on the screen, but um, resting CO2 and blood pressure as well as exercise blood pressure and CO2 were not significantly different between groups. So here we're looking at the association between the farthest distance walked and this change, uh, percent change in MCAV, and it was not statistically significant. So um, there are limitations to this study. It was retrospective, um, and we weren't able to control for the physical activity that these individuals um, did after they discharged from the hospital and then came to our uh, lab at three months. Um, however, it does show some preliminary evidence that during the acute stroke hospital stay, um, that this farthest distance walked could be associated with a greater um, cerebrovascular response or a greater percent change in MCAV at three months into their stroke recovery. Um, and Dr. Billinger has already mentioned our study um, and our manuscript that's been in preprint, um, showing that we also collected physical activity at three months post-stroke, and it was also associated with a higher change in MCAV. Um, so there's definitely a lot of um, research that needs to be done, um, both in rehabilitation and cerebrovascular health. Um, but I, I think there's a large role that um, acute walking and subacute physical activity can play in cerebrovascular health um, post-stroke and with stroke recovery. So I'd like to thank uh, the REACH Lab, um, our collaborators within the hospital, our clinician collaborators, um, and the T32 training program here at KU Med. Um, as well for the funding um, and for the training in neurological and rehab science. All right, any questions? Allison, great job. <laughs> um, so you do have a, a question from Geary. Uh, Allison, were they receiving any therapy up until the three mark, sorry, three month mark when you recruited? Uh, did you account that into your dynamic uh, modeling calculations? And then there's another statement, which I'll give you, I'll let you answer those before I move forward. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, so for our recruitment into our prospective study, um, we recruited from the rehab setting at KU Med. 
So I would say most of the individuals that we did recruit were getting um, inpatient rehab after they discharged from the hospital. Um, I did not account for, you know, the minutes of rehab that they received um, or the specific interventions that they received. Um, but that's a really great question, um, definitely, to look into further um, the amount of physical activity between um, hospital and three months and what that would look like. Uh, just just to make sure I may have not asked it clearly, but um, so I think he was asking uh, the question, I think the question was centered around, you know, do, were they were they in outpatient thera therapy or doing anything? I know you said something about their inpatient, but what about at that time in between? Do you have information on that? I don't have information about outpatient physical therapy, no. Okay. Uh, can you also perhaps shed light into looking into why looking into MCAV affects lower extremity functional outcomes such as distance walked? Okay, say that again. Can you uh, also perhaps shed light uh, why uh, looking into MCAV may affect lower extremity functional outcomes such as distance walked? Gotcha. Um, so I'm not necessarily making. Um, that association that MCAV um, can uh, improve these uh, walking capability. Um, I, because this is a retrospective analysis, I don't think I can make those um, assumptions, but I, I really wanted to look at physical activity and this idea of overall cerebrovascular health um, and the amount of walking that these individuals were doing, the physical activity in their hospital stay and then what their cerebral vascular health was looking at three months. Great. Uh, there's a couple other comments and questions, but I think just to be respectful of time and the other speakers, I'd like to move on. Okay. All right, our next speaker is Andrew Robertson. Robertson. He's a, a research associate, um, and he is up next. Andrew? Okay, thank you for the introduction, Sandy, and thank you for the invitation to sh share some of my work with you uh, as part of this uh, seminar series. I'm currently uh, a research senior research associate at the University of Waterloo, but the, the data that I'm going to show with you today was uh, collected and analyzed during my postdoctoral fellowship at Sunnybrook Research Institute as part of the University of Toronto, working within the Canadian Partnership for Stroke Recovery. And it's been 25 years since uh, Potempa et al. first identified physiological outcome benefits from using aerobic exercise as an intervention in stroke. However, the majority of uh, research that has looked into benefits, in, at least in the human world, has really focused on global benefits, cardiorespiratory function, a lowered uh, cardiovascular risk profile, improvements in mood, uh, cognition, and, and sensory motor function. Very little, uh, in contrast, has looked at cerebrovascular function. A couple of exceptions have already been touched on, looking at uh, uh, Richard Mako's group, led by Fred, Fred Ivey, showed an increase in cerebrovascular responsiveness to carbon dioxide, an increase in 27% following six months of treadmill walking. And uh, a little bit more recently, we showed using arterial spin labeling MRI, a 15% global increase in cerebral blood flow following six months of a multimodal exercise program modeled after a cardiac rehabilitation strategy. So this, uh, the increase in blood flow was primarily in the parietal lobe, but we, we saw trends for increases in, uh, across the brain. Now the working theory for what's driving these cerebrovascular adaptations to exercise is uh, one potential mechanism is increased shear stress. However, uh, until uh, very recently, and, and the bulk of what the recent findings are coming from Dr. Billinger's lab, is we don't know what are the hemodynamic responses during exercise in individuals with stroke. When we look at an individual with stroke, we're not only concerned with the uh, infarcted tissue or the, the area of the infarction or the immediate penumbra surrounding the infarction, but when we look at structural scanning, and this is a flare MRI scanning, MRI scan, which shows widespread ischemic damage, what we call white matter hyperintensities. And this, this bright white area is 
an indication of subtle changes in water content in underlying tissue. It could be associated with demyelination of, the, of uh, white, fi white matter fibers or uh, in, uh, active immune responses in gray or white matter. So we see this kind of widespread, actually you often see it bilaterally, you don't necessarily see it in this image, but you often see it bilaterally in, in stroke patients. You also see it in a group of patients that we refer to as small vessel disease. These are individuals that uh, likely have an accumulation of cardiovascular risk factors, but they're showing no neurological uh, symptoms, such as cognitive uh, or mood symptoms that might be indicative of their underlying pathology. The only way that we uh, find uh, these participants is through MRI imaging or CT imaging that identify changes in, in the white matter integrity or perhaps small lacunar infarctions in the deep white matter. So uh, one thing that is, that is important to, to recognize is that the accumulation of these of this subtle white matter changes have been linked to hemodynamic uh, impairment in individuals at rest. And, and one of the key characteristics of this hemodynamic impairment is changes in the pulsatility of the cerebral blood flow. Pulsatility index is commonly characterized or, or quantified using Gosling's index, which looks at the amplitude normalized to mean velocity across the cardiac cycle. And we see that uh, with increasing leukariosis or increasing white matter hyperintensity burden, we see increasing pulsatile characteristics uh, of the uh, middle cerebral velocity. So what are the, what's the impact of this pulsatility in individuals' response to exercise is something that we we're interested in. In addition, in stroke, as well as in hypertension, uh, hypertensive adults, there's, it's common to see an exaggerated exercise pressure reflex in which systolic blood pressure at any given submaximal exercise level is exaggerated compared to individuals, in this case, in control individuals versus stroke, or uh, in, in other cases of hypertensive or cardiovascular, individuals with cardiovascular risk factors. So in exercise, we see uh, the, the supervasculature has to deal with an increased systolic pulsatile uh, blood pressure demand. And this, uh, this stress that's put on the supervasculature may be elevated in individuals who have already enhanced pulsatility uh, in the supervasculature, such as we see as in stroke or in indiv individuals with small vessel disease. So in the study, our aim was to examine how MCA blood velocity responds during the moderate intensity exercise bout in individuals with chronic cerebral uh, vascular impairment. And to assess this, we recruited uh, a few groups. First, uh, stroke individuals were recruited between three and 12 months following their stroke. Uh, and I'll show some of the participant characteristics on the following slide. Uh, a second group of older adults between 55 and 80 years old were, a, were recruited together. Uh, these individuals were recruited with or without various cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, and, or controlled type two diabetes. And uh, they were all uh, recruited based on having a sedentary lifestyle, including less than 90 uh, minutes of physical activity per week. We also included a, a, a young control group just to compare our responses to. Our protocol uh, was a recumbent cyclogometer looking at bilateral super blood flow velocity responses, as well as blood pressure responses. Uh, we collected data for five minutes at rest. We had a graded warm up to try and mimic the exercise that you would see during a, a clinical exercise rehabilitation program of three minutes increasing uh, work rate intensity up to a moderate intensity level of 45 to 55% heart rate reserve. And then a grad, uh, again, a graded active recovery cool, cool down and seated recovery. So here are participant demo, the demographics, just quickly highlighting the cerebrovascular characteristics of our small vessel disease and stroke cohort. The lesion volume in our stroke was uh, small and was within uh, primarily within the MCA territory. Our individuals with stroke had to meet an inclusion criterion of being, inclusion criterion of being able to walk for 10 minutes 
uh, with or without uh, uh, an assistive aid, but independently. Um, and again, they were between three and 12 months post-stroke on average, five months post-stroke. But all in all, their stroke was uh, mild characteristics with uh, minimal lower limb uh, impairments. We do see elevated white matter hyperintensity in both our small vessel disease group and our stroke group compared to our old. And, and to distinguish between old and small vessel disease, we used a, a cutoff of um, a uh, white matter hyperintensity volume of 10 mils, uh, which is equivalent to uh, just under 0.1% uh, of intracranial volume. Uh, so looking at the results now, so uh, just some characteristic uh, responses looking at the pulse waveform on the left-hand side. And then here we see our pulsatility index change uh, reported as a percent change from rest and our mean velocity reported as a percent change from rest. Our young participants are in yellow, our old participants are in blue, our small vessel disease in green, and our, our stroke are in pink. And clearly looking at pulsatility index, we see the small vessel disease have an exaggerated increase in pulsatility almost immediately, but statistically significant. These are five minute averages, which we did our statistics on. And we see by 10 minutes of exercise, the small vessel disease group have elevated pulsatility compared to the other three groups. And there were no difference between our young, old, and stroke, looking at uh, relative change from rest. In contrast, our young group had a uh, elevated increase in mean velocity, but there were no differences in the mean velocity response. About a 15% change for both our old small vessel disease group, and actually over the over the progression of the 20 minutes of exercise, mean velocity tended to, to regress back to uh, resting baseline uh, in all four groups. If we look at absolute changes in pulsatility index instead of relative, we did not see the expected uh, effect at rest where small vessel disease group and the stroke group who have higher white matter hyperintensity levels did not show an elevated pulsatility index. There was a trend for some elevation in pulsatility in our stroke group, uh, but overall not much of an effect. It wasn't until exercise, and here I'm showing the exercise uh, pulsatility from the last five minutes of our 20 minute bed of exercise. And here and now we have a group effect where the small vessel disease group was significantly higher than our young group, and there were just trends for elevated pulsatility in the stroke group. Now, this, uh, these trends are just looking at uh, absolute PI and not accounting for some of the central cardiovascular measures that we that we uh, that changes that occur uh, simultaneously during the exercise. So we see there are group differences in in, in pulse pressure, and as expected. In our small vessel disease group, there was a huge increase in pulse pressure even during our warm up, graded warm up, and that was maintained throughout exercise. Uh, surprisingly, the pulse pressure in our stroke group did not increase uh, differently from our young or old control groups. When we controlled for changes in mean arterial pressure and pulse pressure, as well as heart rate and stroke volume, then we see standardized parameter uh, estimates of, of uh, group differences in pulsatility. So we see when controlling for our central cardiovascular measures here, the pulsatility in our uh, small vessel disease and stroke group was about one and a half standard deviations greater than our young groups and about one standard deviation greater than our old groups during exercise. So this suggests that exercise is a stimulus that enhances the pulsatility of our cerebral blood, flow, blood velocity in these individuals with chronic ischemic damage. So I mentioned uh, a lot of uh, evidence now exists in the, uh, showing the correlation between the degree or the volume of white matter hyperintensities in this small vessel disease group, as well as stroke groups and pulsatility. And we did not see uh, this. This is uh, potentially due to our, our small sample having a relatively low lesion burden or low burden of hyper white matter hyperintensity. This is a, a Spearman regression looking at all three groups of our older adults, so old, small vessel disease, and, and stroke all combined. And we see no change in pulsatility index with a log of our white matter hyperintensity volume. When we look at our exercise data, however, now we see an association. 
where exercise seems to be a stress that uncovers latent dysfunction in our cerebrovasculature, such as pulsatility is now not as well regulated, and we're having pulsatility indices up uh, in excess in some cases of 1.8. And uh, the increase in pulsatility index is much uh, greater in the individuals who are having, uh, who have a much larger white matter hyperintensity volume burden. So the key messages uh, here are the hemodynamic pulsatility is a marker of small vessel dysfunction. The stress of exercise may be uh, necessary, especially early on in, in the disease uh, in the in the disease track to look at how ex this exaggerated pulsatility or the cerebrovascular dysfunction occurs. And this has potential implications for exercise prescription in older adults with stroke, as well as elevated cardiovascular risk who may be at a greater risk for small vessel disease. And that could include slower progression intensity duration prescriptions so that we can mitigate the central increases in pulse pressure or the exaggerated pressure, uh, the exaggerated exercise pressure reflex, as well as prolonged uh, active warm up cool down strategies that might help mitigate some of the supervascular changes that we were seeing. So this work, again, was done at Sunnybrook Research Institute. And my, uh, my advisor at the time was by the McIntosh, and then this is the team of, of collaborators, both research and clinical collaborators that helped pull it all together. It was supported by the Partnership for Stroke Recovery and CIHR here in Canada. And uh, again, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to you, and I'd like to answer any questions. Great talk, Andrew. Thank you for that. Um, we have about three questions in the box. Um, depending on how quick these go, I may have to limit to one or two and then just look through the chat. Uh, Carolyn Kaufman said, really interesting, is the higher percent PI change during exercise in, in SVD driven by systolic, diastolic velocity, or both? That's a great question. In, uh, in stroke, I believe we did see a reduction in uh, diastolic velocity and an increase in systolic velocity, but in SVD, I believe we, uh, diastolic velocity was maintained and systolic velocity was increased. Okay, on that note, just building on that from uh, Caroline Ricards, um, nice talk, Andrew. What are your thoughts about increased pulsatility of cerebral blood flow being reflective of a compensatory response? to deliver oxygenated blood to the active cerebral tissue in the impaired groups. Can you repeat that one more time, please? Uh, yes. Um, what are your thoughts about the increased pulsatility of cerebral blood flow being reflective of a compensatory response to deliver oxygenated blood to the active cerebral tissue in the impaired groups? Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting. We did look at, uh, we tried to characterize cerebrovascular, uh, cerebrovascular resistance using a model of critical closing pressure, and uh, which can be indic indicative of cerebrovascular tone. And individuals with lower critical closing pressure tended to have uh, increased pulsatility. Um, so, it may be a, a chronic compensation to, to facilitate increased, uh, increased blood flow at rest that lowers critical closing pressure. And then uh, the, the system is not as well suited to, to deal with the, the increased pressure impact of, or stress impact of the exercise. Thank you. Um, just to be respectful of time for our, our uh, final speaker, um, please, uh, Andrew, look uh, again at the comments in the chat. So our next speaker is uh, Simon Malafant from uh, Université Laval. Um, Simon, you're up next. All right. Everybody's hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. Well, first, Thank you for uh, thank you to Karen Records for inviting me for the uh, this seminar. I will have the chance to uh, speak about exercise intolerance in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. More uh, specifically, into we will dig into the compromised cerebrovascular regulation and oxygenation with exercise. 
in uh, those patients. So first, as a blueprint of the presentation, we will do a general introduction and then talk about my uh, two last studies of my uh, PhD, which is the first, uh, the uh, general mapping of the cerebrovascular function at rest and exercise in PAH, and then the uh, continuous reduction in cerebral oxygenation during an endurance exercise test in those patients that was published this year. So first, PAH is uh, characterized by a progressive increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and a uh, progressively failing right ventricle, which in addition will lead to exercise intolerance. And uh, over the recent decades, we were able to determine that PAH patients were affected by uh, skeletal muscle impairments but also systemic vascular impairments. So the exercise intolerance component was not related only to the heart and the lung, but as a more multi-systemic handbag. So that was the basic of our first study. So we asked the question, so if we have uh, impairments in the muscles, impairment in the uh, vascular uh, component, is there any uh, affected cerebral vascular elements that would have in, that will be impacting the uh, cerebral function and oxygenation at rest and exercise in those patients? So, our first aim was to um, do a comprehensive assessment of the cerebral vascular function at rest and exercise to determine their physiological and clinical consequence. And our hypothesis was based that on the impaired baroreflex sensitivity, the increased sympathetic nerve traffic, and hypocapnia that has been identified in those patients over the last decade. And that might have an impact, obviously, on uh, the MCAV mean and the cerebral oxygenation. So our protocol was established over uh, two visits at the lab. For the first visit, we made all the resting measurements. So we measured uh, cerebral blood flow during a seated rest, as well as cerebral pressure flow relationship at rest and with uh, driven associations. And we measured the cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2 and uh, the uh, central uh, chemoreceptor sensitivity uh, in those patients. And for the second visit, after a 48 hours uh, resting period, we made with the patients the uh, an incremental exercise test and we measured all the cerebral vascular function and oxygenation during this uh, this exercise so here we can see that we have 11 patients and healthy controls that were age and sex matched and we can see here that patients are fairly intolerant to exercise and that they are expressing a deep hypocapnic state. So at rest, we were able to determine that the MCTV mean in the PAH patient was fairly decreased compared to healthy controls. And that was in face of normal vasomotor reactivity. For uh, the pressure flow relationship now during the spontaneous pressure flow relationship using the transfer function analysis, we were able to see that the normalized gains for the patients were higher compared to LT controls, which means that patients are less efficient at damping the amplitude of blood pressure fluctuation. When we did the uh, squat stand maneuvers, we were able to see again that the uh, normalized gain and also the phase were altered in those patients, uh, presenting the, expressing that they are having an altered cerebral pressure flow relationship that will impair their coupling for oxygen delivery to uh, metabolic demand which ultimately can translate into a decreased orthostatic tolerance and explain why patients or those patients, in fact, are at higher risk of syncope. Uh, 
Now, uh, digging into the uh, cerebral vascular reactivity, we were able to see that pH patients are expressing a lower reactivity to uh, CO2, which means that their vessels will be less reactive to CO2, and that cerebrovascular will, the flow will increase less in the, uh, when they are stimulated with CO2. When we go into the uh, chemoreceptor, we were able to see that pH patients are uh, having an increased central chemoreceptor sensitivity, which will translate in uh, increased dyspnea, which we were able to, um, to characterize at rest. We had a correlation with resting ventilation in pH patients only and their ventilation at rest was different from the health controls, and as well during exercise. So their uh, wasted ventilation at exercise, which is characteristically higher than controls, are also modulated, seems at least modulated, through uh, central chemoreceptor sensitivity. Now digging into the uh, incremental exercise, we are able to see first that pH patients are displaying a biphasic response here at the similar level of controls, but, uh, that, but their blood flow is lower compared to controls. We are also able to see that there is rather uncoupling between the cerebral blood flow and the PET CO2 in those patients. We will dig that a little bit further in the next study. We are also now able to see that pH patients are presenting a, a steady decrease in cerebral oxygenation throughout the incremental exercise that was correlated only for pH patients with their exercise intolerance. So the take-home message of the first study is that pH patients are presenting a decreased resting in CAV mean and impaired cerebral pressure flow relationship a decrease in cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2, and an increased central chemoreceptor sensitivity. And at, at the end, uh, an anomalous response in the MCAV mean at exercise and a decreased cerebral oxygenation during the same exercise. So physiologically, what is the meaning of those impairments? So first, with the uh, impaired cerebral pressure flow relationship, that would contribute to orthostatic intolerance in patients. The increased uh, dyspnea and during exercise is, would be explained by both the decrease in cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2 and the increase in central chemoreceptor sensitivity. And the decrease in cerebral oxygenation is contributing to exercise intolerance in those patients. The next study that I am presenting is um, the cerebrovascular uh, mechanism and oxygenation that are uh, stressed using a different modality of exercise, which is endurance exercise. So we wanted really to assess here the, uh, the change in cerebral oxygenation and its physiological determinants during an endurance cycling exercise test. And our hypothesis here was that pH patients would present a similar alteration in the endurance test compared to the incremental test. So first, our method was that we recruited fairly the same patients from the first study. So patients who were willing to come for the second protocol, uh, had a washout period again of uh, 48 hours. Uh, after completing the first protocol, uh, we instrumented them in the, uh, in the lab and we made the, uh, the resting measurements following by the endurance cycling exercise, which was at 75% of their uh, peak workload. Here, what is interesting is that obviously pH patients are presenting again a decrease in uh, endurance time and it's around fairly 36% lower compared to the uh, healthy controls. And uh, they are also displaying uh, the same cerebral here, uh, kinetics 
cerebral oxygenation, the same oxy cerebral oxygenation kinetics compared to the uh, incremental exercise test from the first study. So during an endurance test, the age patients are displaying, uh, again, uh, continuous decrease in cerebral oxygenation. As we can see here, and which is also interesting and a little bit more obvious than in the first study, is that there is a significant abnormal response in the MCAV mean to exercise, which can be illustrated here by an uncoupling between the MCAV mean and the PET CO2. So there is an increase in the MCA, but there is a steady decrease in PET CO2 in patients. And uh, we were thinking about two potential mechanisms to explain this finding. And the first one would be the outer pressure flow relationship that we characterize in our first study. And the second one would be the decrease in cerebral reactivity uh, to CO2 that we also characterize in the uh, first study to explain this aberrant uh, uncoupling between the two previous metrics. So consequently, that would mean that there is no hypocampia damping of MCAV mean during exercise for pH patients only, but that, will, that is making MCAV mean more reliant on uh, MAP for patients only again. Uh, we were also checking about the endurance time. We were curious about... Uh, this matrix, if we can have it as a marker of exercise endurance, as we had for the peak VO2 in the first study. And it did not correlate with the uh, uh, cerebral oxygenation. So that means that it, the endurance time, more specifically, would be not sensitive enough to demonstrate an association between exercise endurance and cerebral oxygenation in our patient's cohort. So the take home message for this last study is that the pH patients are displaying a lower cerebral oxygenation throughout endurance exercise cycling test in a similar kinetic that the, uh, than the incremental exercise test, meaning that with two modality of exercise, pH patients are displaying clearly the same response. There is also an MCAV mean uh, PET CO2 uncoupling, and there is no correlation between cerebral oxygenation and endurance time for patients. So altogether, uh, for the, the pathophysiological implication of those results, we can see that cerebral oxygenation is one of many mechanisms of exercise endurance in pH, and that for a general conclusion for both studies, that there is uh, an impaired cerebral blood flow regulation and oxygenation that is limiting exercise, maximal exercise and endurance capacity in uh, pH patients. And for my last slide, I would like to uh, mark the acknowledgement for my, uh, my PIs, uh, Steve Prolanche and co-PI Sébastien Bonnet, and obviously, my uh, contributor, uh, Patrice Brassard, who uh, was more than happy to uh, dig into uh, those uh, patients' populations. And I'm open for, uh, for questions. All right, we have the last few minutes is uh, trying to look through. Anyone have any questions for Simon? Not seeing any in the chat. So, you know, one of the questions I have, you know, in working with stroke and and getting, you know, large numbers of individuals through, um, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, whether they have pulmonary dysfunction or not, but how how difficult is it for enrollment or what do you think, what do you see as the largest barriers to enrolling individuals with pulmonary hypertension? Well, the, the biggest barrier for recruiting um, is the rarity of the disease. Uh, pH patients is, uh, in fact, 
pH is one of five groups of pulmonary hypertension, and it is characterized as uh, an orphan disease. But we had the chance in our center, in our research center, we had the chance to uh, be the uh, regional center or the uh, we cover all the eastern portion of Canada, so the pH patients are referred to our center. So it, it's a little bit more easy for us to recruit in in this context. But as a, an orphan disease, you have uh, one or two cases per maybe million new cases per year. So if if it's not a tertiary center. We specialized in pulmonary hypertension, it would be much harder to recruit those patients. Yeah, I would imagine so. All right, so I would like to thank, oh, whoops, we have a question come in and then we'll, we'll close out. So from Justin Sprick, great talk, thank you. Did the pulmonary hypertension patients have respiratory acidosis? Any thoughts on how this may have influenced uh, measured cerebrovascular responses? Uh, when they are, they don't have respiratory acidosis in the same manner that the COPD patients would have, for example. Uh, they don't tend to, uh, to accumulate CO2. And um, what was the last part of the question? Any thoughts on it, if they did, uh, how this may have influenced measured cerebrovascular response? The, uh, the influence will come from the opposite. It will come from the uh, hypocapnia. So it's hard to, uh, to normalize for that because there is a difference at the basic for, uh, at, the base, at the baseline from, from health controls. So that might influence the uh, the response to uh, that we have seen in the resting lower NCME. But on the other hand, uh, they are having a, a lower cerebral reactivity, cerebrovascular reactivity to CO2, which means that they, their vessels will be less reactive when you see the. Uh, swings in uh, PCO2. And therefore knowing that means that fairly we can, we can have the comparison that, that we want. And an interesting thing as well is that we compare the uh, MCAV mean. We, we did a correlation between the MCAV mean and the uh, PET CO2 during exercise for pH patients only. And they did not correlate together, but the MCAV mean correlate for patients with the uh, blood pressure during exercise. And we have the opposite for the healthy control. So for the empty control, the uh, MCAV mean was correlating with uh, the PET CO2, but not with the uh, blood pressure. So that was one of our conclusion that uh, the MCAV mean was less reactive and less dependent on CO2 and more dependent of MAP for patients only. Great. Uh, just keeping with everybody's time, I'd just like to thank everyone. But, uh, Simone, there's more comments in the chat if people are hanging around and want to uh, go back and forth and converse with you. But I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for attending today. And uh, I think uh, Pat's going to uh, share with us the next uh, seminar. Yes. Just, uh, I'll, I'll get this slide. Well, he's pulling up the slide. I, you know, appreciate everybody's, uh, the robust discussion and comments and, and uh, thank everyone for that. So again, thank you for, uh, for attending that uh, other interesting meeting. So the next, uh, next one will be on September 30th at 10 a.m. U.S. Central. And I'm really happy to say that uh, Dr. Jill Barnes will chair uh, the session and will be the keynote speaker. And the, the next seminar will be about cerebral blood flow regulation in, in sex-specific conditions. So we are looking forward to, uh, to uh, seeing you there. So again, thank you very much. And have a good day. Thank you, everyone.